Welcome to Sobcast the Podcast, where I, Christina Wolfgram, beg the question, what even is mental health? This podcast is created in collaboration with Dive Through, a mental wellness company that actually knows what they're talking about. Now, you didn't think we were going to start this episode without a trigger warning, did you? Because I have it right here, so you might as well listen to it, you know, while it's here. Even though Sobcast the Podcast is about the pursuit of good mental health, we're going to be talking about some not-so-good mental health things like anxiety, depression, and the end of a walk to remember. Yeah, big spoiler alert. If you haven't seen a walk to remember, maybe you should go watch it. Like right now. I I don't want to be responsible for ruining that Mandy Moore classic for you. It's fine. I will wait. I'll be right here waiting for you. You just go ahead. Okay, you good? Are you okay? Yeah? It's, It's a rough one, but some of that music is just delightful, isn't it? Speaking of a walk to remember, I I would like to share a childhood story with you. I was 11 or 12, just like the most self-conscious you can possibly be years old. You know what I'm talking about? And my mom offered to take me and a friend to go see Walk to Remember in theaters, which was a huge treat. So I invited my friend, uh, let's call her, let's call her Anne. I invited my friend Anne. We played soccer together. Um, we had, we had, you know, had a couple play dates where we uh, used Trinky Dinks. That was, that was a really big deal. Felt like we really connected over that. And you know, at the end of the movie, you watched it, right? Okay, I'm about to, I'm about to spoil it. At the end of the movie, Mandy Moore dies. And Shane, what's his name? Whoever that guy is in that movie, where is he? He is really cute, but he just kind of disappeared. He makes this just heart-wrenching monologue about how his life had changed and how love you know, stuff and how he was married and I don't know, they're like 17, but whatever. It just hit so hard. And my mom and I were just like (laughs) sobbing, just openly sobbing as if Mandy Moore was our best friend and that we knew that Shane's career was going wherever it was going. Like we just, we felt the loss and we were really sad. And my friend Anne was sitting with us just like horrified. (laughs) And later when we weren't with my mom, she said something along the lines of like, wow, that was weird. And I thought back to, all the times that my mom and I had cried at the end of movies, like, remember the Titans? Oh, boy, that one was very sad. Uh, even, like, I think I, I used to cry at the end of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, or, I mean, obviously during The Lion King. Not even at the end. I won't get into that. I'm not going to spoil that one. Spoil your day with that one. But, I mean, there was a lot of crying in my house. We, I don't know, my mom and I are the crying type. Let me put it that way. And I, at the time, I thought my mom and I were the weird ones. Specifically me, because... I was 11 and thought I was an adult and didn't want anyone to think I was strange. But now, looking back on it, I think maybe Anne was 
it, was she living in a in a house where no one ever cried? Like it's really possible. Her mom always wore a polo shirt and like khakis like all the time. I don't know that that would indicate whether or not <laughs> anyone showed emotion. It's just these are the things I remember. Thanks a lot, brain. I think memories like that have really influenced me because I would like to live in a world where it's not weird to cry in public and that it would be kind of unexpected or or abnormal to have lived to the age of 11 and not seen any of your loved ones express emotion like that. Whether it's crying or just, uh, you know, expressing in a different healthy way. Obviously, I believe that any way that you show emotion that doesn't hurt other people is valid. So, I don't know. My friend recently called my philosophy on crying... She called it the crying crusade, (laughs) which I absolutely love. (laughs) It makes it sound way more important than it is. What did she mean? Well, I I do like to talk about crying a lot. I, I have a whole store that I made from nothing that's just full of t-shirts and sweatshirts that say crying is cool because I want people to see that shirt in public and be like, oh, I'm, I, you know, that person thinks it's cool. So maybe I, I'm not weird for being on the edge of tears, like every second of my day, (laughs) LOL. So let me bookend that, uh, walk to remember story with, Something that happened more recently, in the last few years, I was meeting up with a former boss who I worship. She is so smart and so fabulous and just was the best boss, inspired people, was patient and firm, and just taught me so much. Like, she is a goddess in my eyes forever. And I couldn't believe that we were going to meet drinks, meet drinks. We were going to meet drinks. Hello, wine. (laughs) Hello, tequila. Nice to meet you. We were going to meet four drinks. (laughs) Couldn't believe we were going to meet four drinks like adults, like colleagues. I was so excited. And She texted me to let me know she was running a little bit late. And then, I mean, obviously, I was not upset. I was like, you can run 14 hours late. I will be here for you. She got there, you know, maybe like 10 minutes later. And she told me that the reason she was late was because she was crying. What? She was crying because she was overwhelmed by a decision she had to make. Oh my giddy gob. (laughs) It changed my perception so much to hear that this person that I admired with my whole being could admit that she was crying. Not because she was like really devastated, not because, you know, something really sad had happened or she was disappointed. Although those all are obviously totally reasonable, reasonable reasons to cry. But just that she was overwhelmed, like a totally normal everyday emotion that she was expressing through crying. I just... It inspired me to talk about expressing emotions so much more. 
because I've been crying since I was born. <clears throat> and still, I feel embarrassed if I shed a tear in public. I recently spent like 10 hours in an airport and I cried just the whole time. It was like a leaky faucet, just constant dripping to the point where like I wasn't even feeling emotions anymore. I was just physically crying. <laughs> you know that feeling? I used to work in an office there was a bathroom very close by and that was my room of choice when it came to crying after a meeting. And I can't tell you how many times I would go into that bathroom to have a little, a, just a little midday sob and I would run into one of my coworkers who had the same idea <laughs> and we would cry in the bathroom and then we'd kind of laugh it off. And um, it was very cathartic because I think that expressing your feelings better out than in, as a great greed man once said, <laughs> it's the reason that we can cry, right, is to basically open ourselves up and make sure that these feelings don't get caught inside. All of this to say is that ever since that happened with my former boss, I have felt a calling to share my experiences so that other people like me feel a little better, even just slightly just like 0.1% better. That's a huge improvement. It's <laughs> all you can ask for. So I wanted to share a list of some of the times that I've cried. Maybe, maybe you can uh, relate. Uh, every single year on the last day of school, I openly wept. Not that I wasn't excited for summer. I definitely was. I think I just dreaded change so much. And the thought of the unknown, of getting older, like this thing that I couldn't prevent. Like, yeah, as a kid, I was already thinking about how like time passes and you can't have it back and how devastating that is. And for whatever reason, it really manifested on the last day of school every year. We'd be like signing yearbooks and my tears would just be dropping on the yearbook page. <laughs> and, you know, to a lot of teachers' credit, I didn't feel like anyone was like making fun of me or anything. At least not to my face. Anyway, um, I went to church weekly as a kid and I cried during church often. I think it was because sometimes those songs and the piano music would just really move me. I... <laughs> so I'd be standing with my family and um, singing along and just kind of dramatically letting a tear fall down my face. I really couldn't help it. Um... I cried the first time that I asked for a raise <laughs> because I'm a professional. I am a business woman. But um, it was a really, really overwhelming experience. And I felt extremely uncomfortable trying to convince somebody that I was worth more than what I was getting. <laughs> That's something I should discuss with my therapist, but... Truly, I was, like, overwhelmed by the uh, thought of having to prove myself. 
I was sad that I felt like I didn't even believe some of the things that I was saying about myself. And I was nervous as heck because, I don't know, I was young and I thought, I am the first person on this earth to ever ask for a raise. They're going to be so mad at me. I'm getting fired today. (laughs) You know what? I ended up getting the raise. um, But it's still, I wish it wasn't. It's still a little embarrassing. I wish I had a... No, see, this is exactly why I'm talking about this. It's exactly why I want people to know that crying is cool. Because it should have been totally fine that I cried in a meeting that was hard. Like, why not? Uh, Yeah. Anyway, on with my list before I go down a rabbit hole of thinking about times I've asked for raises. Um, I... I cry during any confrontation. So if anyone has any constructive criticism about how I uh, live my life or uh, if I've done something to hurt someone's feelings, unfortunately, I, I cry. And I, I know that f- I know from experience that that can be really frustrating to people. But unpopular, maybe controversial opinion. If seeing someone cry or just expressing their feelings in general makes you uncomfortable, why? I think you should ask yourself because it might be an indication that you're bottling up feelings of your own or maybe that you're having a hard time trusting people. I think sometimes, at least in my life, unfortunately, people have thought that I'm making myself cry on purpose to be dramatic and get my way, which to my anxiety brain is absolutely just terrifying. The worst that's like a fear that I have. (laughs) But you got to do what you got to do. And you can't help how people are going to react to it. So I recently found out that my third house, which is the house of communications on my birth chart, like astrology, my zodiac birth chart thing, The third house is communication and mine is in cancer, which is a sign associated with being emotional, being, being cryy, shedding tears. It's a water sign. And that sums it up for me. (laughs) Anytime I have to communicate any feeling that is bigger than I'm tired. I I cry. Actually, sometimes I even cry because I'm tired. I can't I can't help the way I was built. Um that's just how it is. Sometimes it it I have to accept the way I am, and I encourage you to do the same. Some other places that I've cried in my car. In multiple bathrooms, at the airport, oh god, and at PetSmart, where they keep all the cats that I'm not allowed to adopt. (laughs) Oh god. Uh, You know what else? Speaking of crying about animals, recently um, I was staying with a dear friend and she has a very small Pomeranian, I'm talking... It's like four pounds of just fur, I think. I think if we shaved that dog, it would weigh like half a pound. It's it's unbelievable, unimaginable. I can't believe that dog exists. And one night we were watching TV and we were between episodes of something and she looked over at me with tears in her eyes, genuine 
just emotion all over her face. And she said, my dog is so small. (laughs) And it made me cry too. (laughs) I guess there were a lot of things wrapped up in it. The fact that something so wonderful and so sweet exists. The fact that we haven't always had sweet, fluffy things in our lives. The fact that everything good must come to an end. The fact that we are also very small little pieces of the universe. Like, to Jupiter, we're that little fluffy dog. (laughs) Yes, the planet Jupiter. So, yeah, there's a lot to cry about. It ended up in us, like, laughing, laugh crying. (sighs) But that actually brings me to uh, one of my points that I want to make about my my pro-crying agenda is that tears are a way of communicating. And that starts when we're babies. Uh, I actually, I read something by a man named Jeffrey. Jeffrey Kotler wrote a book called The Language of Tears. And their argument was that... Humans take so much longer to become self-sufficient and be able to like fend for ourselves than any other animal. And in the wild, we would have to have a silent way to communicate like, I need help. I need a shoulder to cry on. Because if we were just wailing all the time, in the wild, we'd eventually get eaten by, like, a lion or a hippopotamus or something. I I like thinking about the way that humans are different than just a small furry dog. I think that being able to communicate through crying is actually, a, it's a gift it's it's the same, I think, the same um, magic within us that enable us, us to be able to create art and to be able to love each other and to be able to imagine and be able to dream. I think that's all coming from the same well that tears come from. And when we're crying, we're communicating things like, you know, I'm upset. I am, I am sad. I'm hungry. (laughs) But the biggest of all is I trust you. If I'm crying around you, I trust you. I trust that you're going to try to understand what's going on with me. So, If society was more open to expressing feelings, making it more of a daily part of life, I think it would create a more trusting environment in general. You know, when we hide our sadness or our anger or even our happiness, that It doesn't feel good, right? Doesn't it feel like it gets caught in your chest? It just, if we could just be open about it. I feel like that that girl in Mean Girls who's like, I wish we could bake a cake full of rainbows and smiles and we could all eat it together. (laughs) She doesn't even go here. That's me. I regret nothing. I regret nothing. (laughs) 
Um, <laughs> I I have some more information in this notebook. I have written it down. Um, pro crying, my my pro crying. I vote for crying. Um, there was actually an experiment where a group of people watched a sad movie and the people who cried during the sad movie felt worse than they did when they walked in, like right after the movie. They were feeling a little more bummed. But then when the researchers checked in with everyone after 90 minutes... The people who watched the movie and had just kind of just, you know, been there, not crying, were kind of at the same level they were, whereas the people who had cried felt better than when they walked into the movie. So, I mean, science, science says that it's a catharsis, right? It's a, it's a release. And, um... Ooh, ooh, there is another science thing I wanted to share with you. Ooh, 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 where is it? Where is it? Um, uh, oh, yeah, okay. So there are three kinds of tears in our eyeballs. Isn't that amazing? Look at your human body go. So the three kinds of tears are basil. I think I'm saying that right. Not like a basil leaf, but that's just like the kind of tear that keeps your eye hydrated. <laughs> And a reflex tear, which is like when your eye is reacting to something that's, um, a, just, you know, irritating it. And then there are emotional tears. And apparently emotional tears release oxytocin and endorphins. And we all know what endorphins do, right? Endorphins make you happy. And happy people don't just kill their husbands. <laughs> For the record, I understand why crying and and showing emotion can be confusing, especially if you grew up in an environment where it wasn't a part of your life a lot. Or, you know, if it just, if it's not how you do things um as as far back as the 1600s people have been asking what the heck and um at that time way back then in the 1600s people thought that emotions heated up your heart so much that the body generated water to cool your heart down And then that would create a vapor that rose up into your head and then turned into tears. Like condensation on your face. I love the imagery of like a super red hot heart being a symptom of feeling deeply. And I also think it's funny that in the 1600s they thought that like our entire body was apparently hollow. (laughs) So that vapor could just rise up to our brains from our heart. Like, incredible. <laughs> but it's it's also mysterious sometimes when, let's say, you're crying and you don't know why. Or if you're a person who doesn't often show their emotions or express your emotions in that way. And then all of a sudden you find yourself crying. That can be surprising and maybe even kind of scary if you don't practice that and you're not in tune with like your body's response to intense situations. For me, something that gets kind of confusing is like, okay, where's the line between me crying because I'm regular old sad and me crying because I am falling into a depression. And that can be hard. 
I have found through years of researching my own behaviors that when I can cry freely and really <laughs> let it out, I'm actually less likely to fall into depression. And it's those times where I can't even put words to how I'm feeling because it's just such a weird, dark hole inside that hollow body of mine. That's when I should be watching out for for the blues, for the dark blues. And that's a time where I need to get out my mental health tools and kind of prepare. <laughs> but um yeah, it is it's so interesting to how over the entire history of humans stories you know people are shedding tears um and how how different cultures react to people who want to show their emotions i'm i wanted to tell you about this um incredible incredible concept in japan some cities have opened what are called crying clubs. They're, they call them, um, I really hope I say this right, huikatsu, which means tear-seeking. So it's basically a restaurant where the menu is like tears, <laughs> At happy hour, they're like, here's a sad movie to get you going. And the philosophy behind it is that you can experience catharsis by releasing your feelings and, and crying, but also that seeing other people cry and being around other people can feel, can forge kind of a, a human bond that makes people feel better. I mean, definitely less alone. This is also my way of telling you that I think my new purpose in life is to open a crying club in the United States. Christina's crying club has a really nice ring to it. Wait, that's, that is a really good... Oh my gosh, is that my new life? Oh my cry... Ooh. Imagine just... A beautiful, cushy, lovely kind of restaurant where you can just get some comfort food and there's tissues on every table and it's and it's not like crummy tissues like you get at the doctor, but like those like quilted, maybe the ones that have like lotion in them. I don't know. I've never even bought those. Should I? Mm. Wow, there's like, the, I could put like waterproof mascara in all the bathrooms. Uh, wow, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know when that's so Raven when she would have like a vision? That is exactly what's happening to me right now. I'm having a vision of Christina's crying club. And it's good. I can't wait. Ooh, a crying club, but it's also a cat cafe. I'm just, okay, now I'm just pitching you ideas, business ideas. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> this is so exciting that uh, you're here with me for this. Um, wow, this is my origin story. Okay. 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 Um, what else did I want to tell you about crying? Mm. I wanted to share this statistic mostly because I think it's interesting and I'm really curious to hear what you think about it. So maybe like hop on over to the Instagram or like just I'd really like to know your first reaction to this. Apparently, 
American women cry 3.5 times a month. And American men cry 1.9 times a month. So focusing on the women, because I identify as a woman, they're saying that on average, you're crying just a little less than once a week. Hmm. (laughs) I feel like they didn't include people like me in this survey because I think I would have brought that number way up. (laughs) It's like less 3.5 times a month and more like 3.5 times a day. Yeah, is that is that strange? Is it I know it's I know it's okay. It's healthy for me. It's definitely okay for me, but I am um I'm curious to hear. And I also I think I I really need to talk about my reaction to men crying on average 1.9 times a month. Because that feels high to me and I don't like that. I don't want that to feel high to me. There's absolutely stigmas around men, not just crying, but expressing themselves and feeling out in, their, out in the open. I think... I. I wish there were way more examples of men in media and important, important men crying. So, so we all see it. So it just becomes just totally normal and not just in completely dire situations, like in, in everyday Very normal situations. Right? Anyone else? The science had some things to say about this statistic. And the science people think hormones might play a role in how much people cry. And, um... Apparently, according to according to science, testosterone makes people less likely to cry, whereas prolactin, which is um, a hormone that is often higher in women, uh, makes it more likely that you'll cry. Is it that easy? It's so. It's so hard to wrap my head around times where science and physiology and psychology and mental health all are in the same room. (laughs) Because I think of crying as such a, a spiritual very human occurrence and then here's the textbook saying nope you might just have more prolactin you are pro lactin i'm like no i'm just pro crying that's not the same thing right right also these statistics are just from one study But I also need to point out that scientists are not spending a lot of time studying crying because they have a lot of bigger things on their minds. But if they ever need to study someone who cries a lot, I volunteer as tribute. The moral of my story (laughs) is that... I want to make sure you don't feel alone in your feelings. 
you have no idea who is showing up to meet you for drinks who was just crying in their car because we hide it. (laughs) And if you are feeling really big feelings and you're hiding it, I truly hope that you find a space, an empathetic space where you feel like you can express yourself. And that could be here. I love to hear about the last time you cried and what made you cry and what your favorite brand of tissues are. That's that is what Sobcast is all about. So thank you so much for coming to my TED Talk. Crying is cool. And may your waterproof mascara stay on your eyelashes. I salute you. (laughs) Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. It would super help if you subscribed, left a review, call your grandma, tell her to listen. And if you want more, Sobcast the podcast, follow us on Instagram. All right. See you next week. Love you. Bye.